Right, well, thank you everybody for joining. Hopefully we have most people on the line now. We have an exciting new format today. Um, as you hopefully realize, this is going to comprise three bite-sized seminars followed by a networking session, which will last for about 10 minutes. There will then be a further three short webinars followed by a further breakout session. More on the breakout session to follow after the first three webinars. Um, but I am delighted to say we have a great lineup today. We have Phil Judd first and foremost with the voluntary and compulsory liquidations. We then have Daniel Goldblatt dealing with liquidators' investigatory powers. And then we have Emily Moore dealing with claims against directors and third parties. For those of you who paid attention to our invite initially, you'll note that that is changing the running order slightly. Um, and that I'm delighted to say uh, very subtly is because we have no less than four members of chambers in the Supreme Court today. So we've had to giggle around um, with the running order there. Can I um, remind everyone that we are dealing with a broad range of topics at quite a basic level. So if you are an experienced practitioner, um, we will not be offended if you want to log off at this stage. Um, but thank you for joining in any event. Um, for the rest of you, hopefully you know what you're getting yourselves involved in, and we look forward to getting to know you better during the network session. I would love to hand over now to Phil Judge, who's going to talk about voluntary and compulsory liquidations. Thanks, Ellen. Hi, everyone. Um, just bear me whilst I try and share my screen. I hope this works. There we go. Right. I should all be able to see my screen now with some PowerPoint slides. Um, but to briefly introduce myself, my name is Phil Judd. I'm a junior in Chambers and I was called in 2017. I'll be discussing both voluntary and compulsory liquidations and be providing what I hope is a useful primer and introduction to both areas. Um, and in the spirit of them being bite-sized introductions, they are both potentially potentially expansive topics. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the areas I'm discussing, um, and some of you may not be, but I hope it's useful for both of those groups. Um, and if you have any questions, then I think there's going to be a breakout session in about an hour. Um, and if you have a burning desire to ask about liquidations, I'm sure you can ask to join the room that I'm in. So it might be useful just to save any questions and until then. So considering firstly what a liquidation is, um, to start from the basics, and I'm sorry if I'm teaching anyone suck eggs here, uh, but very briefly, it's a procedure for realizing assets for creditors. And there are two types, there's voluntary liquidations and compulsory liquidations. Um, compulsory uh, is at the instigation of companies' creditors, and it's what we might typically call winding up proceedings, uh, and is ordered by the courts. And there are voluntary uh, liquidations, which are generally by resolution of the members or sometimes by creditors. But I'll deal with them in reverse order because um, it may be that people aren't familiar with the voluntary liquidation procedure as they might be for the more contentious or often contentious compulsory liquidation uh, route. And in terms of voluntary liquidations, there are two different types. <clears throat> the first one is members voluntary liquidation, uh, which I'll call an MVL as a simple shorthand. Um, and there are creditors voluntary liquidations, which I'll call CVL. Now, the main difference between the two, and this is something to bear in mind for the next five minutes or so, is that an MVL uh, is initiated where a company is solvent, um, subject to a contingent claim issue, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, and in an MVL, the directors are required to make a declaration of solvency. That is that the company is likely to meet its liabilities in the next 12 months. Um, and the creditors are therefore not involved in the decision making in a way they are in a CVL but both a CVL and MVL commence when the members pass a resolution to wind up. Now, I'm hoping my slide is going to move on to a slide entitled MVL. Um, people jump up and down and shout if that's not actually just happened. Now, MVLs, given that they occur when the company um, is solvent, uh, the directors are required to make what's called a statutory declaration under section 89 of the Insolvency Act. And it is worth uh, giving that act a quick read if you're not familiar with the provision. And it states in brief, and I'm paraphrasing slightly here, 
that the directors must make a statutory declaration to the effect that they have made a full inquiry into the company's affairs and that having done so, they have formed the opinion that the company will be able to pay its debts in full together with interest within such period not exceeding 12 months from the commencement of the winding up. Now, that declaration must be made before the passing of the resolution to wind the company up, but not earlier than five weeks before that resolution. Uh, and that resolution must then be delivered to the registrar within 15 days. And that 15 day period starts on the day after the resolution is passed. Now, something to bear in mind here is of course, a declaration by a director has to be uh, rooted in reasonable belief. Um, and section 89, subsection four does carry consequences for directors who don't make a declaration having satisfied themselves uh, of the sort of inquiries they need to. And they can, this might seem a little draconian, um, be slammed with a fine or imprisonment. Um, and I'll deal later on uh, with what happens when directors don't make those sorts of inquiries. But as to the sort of inquiries they do need to make, um, I've set out two cases here, the BAT Industries case and the LRH Services case. And in that, or in those two judgments, um, the sort of inquiries that a, a director needs to make or directors need to make was discussed. Um, and what they have to do is assess liabilities, both contingent and prospective, against assets. Um, but the slightly confusing area here is that it's not simply an aggregating exercise or a mathematical accounting exercise where the two sums are added together and then the director makes a reasonable assessment after that. Um, it's quite a complicated and involved factual exercise that directors should be aware that if they are later asked to uh, account for how they made that decision, um, they should be able to do so thoroughly because it does depend on quite involved factual considerations, for example, where the company is relying upon receivables in the future. The directors have to make an assessment as to whether or not those receivables are likely um, to be realizable um, and the nature of the debt and so on comes into consideration. And bearing in mind the consequences of not making those inquiries, uh, directors should be, should be aware in embarking upon an MVL um, that they could be on the hook in the event that it does go uh, pear-shaped. Now, the process um, is also worth bearing in mind in beginning an MVL. Um, it of course starts when the resolution is passed by members to wind up the company. That resolution must be by a special resolution. Um, I've set out very briefly what that process then might involve, but consideration needs to be given here to qualified floating charge holders who may be able to um, request an administrator uh, if they have the right to do so, but they do lose that right uh, if they don't receive, sorry, don't act upon the written notice which is provided to them, uh, which must be given um, within five days of them having received that notice. So it's a relatively tight time frame for qualified floating charge holders to exercise any rights they might have. Now, after the resolution is passed, it's quite important to bear in mind that the director's powers actually cease upon appointment of a liquidator unless the liquidator or the members of the company by way of a general meeting allow them to continue. And that's contained within section 91 of the Insolvency Act. Um, there are various notices to be provided. Um, the declaration of solvency and special resolution must be filed with the registrar, for example, within 14 days of the resolution. Um, and I won't walk you through the various other notices that are required because they're quite laborious, but they're set out within sections 84, 85 and 109 of the Insolvency Act. Now, what happens when a liquidator is appointed in MVL? <clears throat> Daniel Goldblatt is going to discuss their investigatory powers, but very, very briefly, and I won't stray into his patch too far, they in large part take over the powers that a director might otherwise have uh, in ordering the affairs of a company. Um, they're particularly wide, and those of you who are familiar with Schedule 4 will know that there's quite a long list of things that a, a liquidator can do, but they're able to, for example, pay any class of creditors or compromise or make arrangements with creditors as may be required. They're also required to produce progress reports uh, once a year, the first one being one year from appointment and thereafter. Um, the contents of those progress reports are set out at Rule 18.3, uh, but in brief, <clears throat> what they're required to do is give an update on the progress of the um, liquidation and provide a summary of receipts, payments, remuneration, and so on. Now, <clears throat> after their activities are complete, they must produce a final account and deliver it in draft form uh, and give notice to the members. 
Uh, and then when that final account is approved, the liquidator is released and the company is dissolved three months later. Um, so we can see throughout that process, creditors have almost no role to play because it's not envisaged that the company is going to go insolvent. So the duties which might otherwise arise to them are not uh, engaged. And that is of course a different circumstance where we have a creditor's voluntary liquidation. But considering the boundary between the two, we have to consider what happens if during the course of an MVL, uh, the liquidator makes an assessment that the original declaration or the belief that the company would be solvent for 12 months does not in fact prove to be correct. Now, there is provision for a liquidation to be transferred from an MVL to a CVL. Um, and this occurs under section 95, where a liquidator forms an opinion that debts cannot in fact be repaid. And there are two important things to note here, particularly when considering how to advise directors and liquidators about whether an MVL or a CVL is appropriate. Um, firstly, is that liquidators act at their peril. Um, there's a case called RE-AMF, which concerned a liquidator who was found liable for costs where they had mistakenly made a, well, disclaimed a lease, made a payment towards the debt under the lease obligations, but then realised after having done so that the company didn't have sufficient assets in order to discharge its liabilities in the future, therefore realising that the company was likely to be insolvent within 12 months and the liquidator was found liable for the cost of the proceedings thereafter. So we do have to be aware that the liquidator does have to um, bear in mind that they are personally responsible for um, anything that may come if they put that company in a position such as that. Uh, and secondly, bearing in mind that statutory declaration, directors may be on the hook for having made a declaration of solvency without a reasonable and honest belief um, in the company's solvency. And if it, of course, transfers between an MVL and a CVL, um, the sanctions which are provided by section 89 <clears throat> might then be landed on a director's head. So there's something to bear in mind. Now, considering CVLs, um, I won't detain us for too long here because CVLs uh, in large part bear a resemblance to MVLs. But of course, given that the company is likely to become insolvent, the duty to creditors does arise. Um, so they bear similarities to an MVL, but creditors of course, have a greater role in decision-making. Now, there's written notice required for holders of qualifying floating charges, the same as within an MVL. Um, but when it comes to the nomination of a liquidator, the creditors are involved in that process. So directors must seek creditor nomination of a person to be liquidator, which takes substantive effect upon nomination. Um, but if the creditor's choice of liquidator differs from that of the members, it's the creditor's nomination that prevails, bearing in mind, of course, that the overriding duty here is now to creditors rather than members. Um, similarly, with an MVL, the director's powers cease uh, on appointments unless the liquidation committee or the creditors rather than members permit their continuation. And the statement of affairs must be sent to creditors as well as members of the company and delivered to the registrar within five days of creditor's nomination. Um, so we can see that creditors have a much greater role in the various steps in a CVL than they would otherwise do in an MVL. Um, and I think those are probably the most important things to consider uh, when differentiating, differentiating the two types of voluntary liquidation. Um, now, I will go on to compulsory liquidation. This is potentially a large and, and expanded area. Um, and many of you will be more familiar with this, I imagine, than you would have been with uh, voluntary liquidations. Um, and it comes with the now quite familiar COVID health warning that, of course, you can't present a winding up petition in compulsory liquidations against the company based upon a statutory demand that was served between March and December of this year. Uh, and you can't present a winding up petition between the 1st of March and 31st of December based on a company's inability to pay its debts, unless you have reasonable grounds for believing that the pandemic has not had a financial effect upon the company or the debt issues. So that is something to bear in mind when considering how compulsory liquidation is operating um, at the moment. But in terms of procedure, compulsory liquidation can be brought by a number of parties, but is generally brought by creditors. Um, and usually the process is that a statutory demand is served upon the company. And there are a few requirements for the basis of a statutory demand, but the main one to bear in mind is that the qualifying debt must be over 750 pounds and the debt itself must not be um, significantly disputed. Now, when the statutory demand has been served, 
three weeks can pass before a company uh, has the opportunity to uh, satisfy or compound the debt. Um, and then the creditor has the opportunity to present what's called a winding up petition to the courts, um, which is then served upon the company. And again, a number of parties can bring um, petitions. I set them out on the slide there, but the main one to bear in mind is that it's, it's creditors who you most often will be dealing with. And the main questions which tend to arise with uh, petitions um, is whether or not the debt is substantially disputed or is genuinely disputed on substantial grounds to use the sort of correct terminology. Um, you often find that companies will try and refute the debt by saying that it's uh, disputed on grounds which appear to be substantial. Um, and this can arise in a number of ways. Um, but the one that came up most recently for me was a circumstance where the creditor was suing on a debt which had been assigned to it by somebody else. And the company simply said, well, there's been no valid assignment, so you don't have standing as a creditor. Um, so you need to bear in mind that a statutory demand and a petition should not be used where there is a, a potential for that sort of substantial dispute to arise because insolvency proceedings are just not the place to decide substantial disputes, which you normally have to air by litigation and the um, evidential limits which, which come with those sorts of processes. Now, provided that's not the case, there are seven grounds on which to wind a company up, which I'll go through very briefly. Um, the most common two are that the company is unable to pay its debts uh, and it's, or it's just inequitable for the company to be wound up. Now, in relation to the first limb there, companies unable to pay its debts, this is where the statutory demand comes in useful because a company which hasn't satisfied or compounded the, uh, the debt under the statutory demand might in so doing demonstrate that it is unable to pay its debts. But we do have a, a definition of unable to pay debts at section 123 of the Insolvency Act. Um, and the test there is applied on the date of the hearing of the application for the winding up order. Um, and there are two real tests. The first one's called the cash flow test. Um, again, many of you might be familiar with this, but this is the inability of the company to pay its debts as they fall due. And this is regardless of the company's asset position. So it might be asset rich, but otherwise cash poor. Uh, and the second one is the balance sheet test, where this is simply a shortfall in the value of the assets um, compared to its liabilities uh, in, in all circumstances considered. Um, and there are further grounds on which to wind up a company. And one of those is that there's a failure to satisfy the statutory demand uh, exceeding £750 within three weeks, uh, where the debtor is, creditor, sorry, is proceeding on a judgment debt, um, or there is, is otherwise proved the satisfaction of court that the company is unable to pay its debts as they fall due. But again, bear in mind, this is not a process that should be used for a disputed debt. Now, the effects of a presentation of a, a winding up petition can be potentially uh, troublesome for a company, which is why the courts are quite alive to the fact that it should not be used where there are there is scope for the debt to be substantially disputed because the presentation of a petition has two quite serious effects for a company. One, the advertisement of the petition will necessarily have a reputational impact for the company. And secondly, section 127 of the Insolvency Act uh, renders void transactions of the company's uh, property or dispositions of the company's property after the presentation of a petition, but before the making of a winding up order. So you have to bear in mind that when presenting a petition, you may be called to account for um, the consequences of a company not being able to deal with its assets as it otherwise might be able to. Um, I've set out on the next slide what happens after an order is made. Um, I won't detain this for too long, but effectively the official receiver becomes a liquidators until the creditors of the company appoints an insolvency practitioner as liquidator. And a number of immediate consequences then follow. Uh, and the liquidator's role um, is largely similar to that within a CVL or an MVL. They can deal with the company's properties uh, as though they were a director um, and realize assets for creditors as appropriate. Um, and when the company is wound up, the company is automatically dissolved three months after the liquidator sends the final accounts to the court. Now, that was a, a very uh, brief skip through of what happens during a compulsory liquidation. But there are four very brief points to bear in mind when considering the difference between a voluntary liquidation and a compulsory liquidation. The first one is that in a voluntary liquidation, 
the powers of the directors come to an end when the liquidator is appointed, whereas in a compulsory liquidation, it's the winding up order that terminates the director's power and dismisses them from office effectively. So the difference between the two routes has implications for directors. Secondly, there's a moratorium on proceedings against the company under a compulsory liquidation, um, which commences when the, the petition is presented on the company, whereas under a voluntary liquidation, there is no such automatic moratorium, which is something to bear in mind. Thirdly, um, and this should, I hope, have been obvious from what I've just been discussing, um, the level of court involvement is a lot different. So under a voluntary liquidation, particularly an MVL, um, the court has very little say in how the company is wound up, although the liquidator can apply to the court for directions if required. But of course, in a compulsory liquidation, it's at the behest and direction of the court as to whether the company is wound up or not. Um, and lastly, the timing of the various processes is a little different. So the liquidation commences in a voluntary liquidation on the passing of the resolution to wind up by the members of the company, whereas a compulsory liquidation com com commences when the petition is uh, presented to the court. So the process itself uh, has different starting guns, as it were. Now, I hope that was a brief and helpful overview of uh, how the various processes work. Um, if you have any questions on either the cases which I've set out on the slide or any procedural um, things, I'm sure I'd be able to answer them in the breakout room uh, later on. But if I now hand over to Daniel Goldblatt, who's going to discuss the liquidators investigatory powers, which I hope would link into some of the things I've just been discussing. Right, so I'll be talking about uh, a liquidator's investigatory powers. Um, because we're, we're looking at investigatory powers, I, I think it's quite helpful actually to, to have a vivid image of an investigator in mind. Um, I grew up in South Africa in the 90s uh, where what was on television was about 10 years behind uh, the rest of the world. So I think uh, for today, sorry, when I think of a, an intrepid investigator, uh, I actually think of Jessica Fletcher from Murder, She Wrote. Uh, so as a result, our hypothetical liquidator for today will be Angela Lansbury playing Jessica Fletcher. Um, now, as Phil uh, discussed and, and touched on, um, there are various things that are quite high up on a, on a list of liquidators' duties and functions. Um, most prominent is the collection, uh, the realization and distribution of assets, first to creditors, and if, if anything's left over um, to the company's contributors. Uh, next, they have a duty to, to take control of the assets uh, and the, the papers and records of the company. And then uh, a liquidator needs to actually ascertain what, what the liabilities of the company uh, are and discharge them in the proper order. And obviously, um, they need to investigate the cause of the company's failure and even whether there's been any criminal offences that have been committed. So to do their jobs properly, uh, liquidators like Jessica Fletcher need to have a, a really clear picture in their mind of, of what the company's assets and liabilities are, uh, who its creditors are, and they need a very good history of the company's past dealings. And once appointed or put in office, a liquidator might walk into a company's offices and face quite a straightforward stumbling block of missing accounts or records, or it might be more serious than that, they might find evidence to suggest some sort of fraud by former directors, um, but there's not enough to issue proceedings. So in order to help liquidators in, in fulfilling their functions, Parliament has, through several provisions in the Insolvency Act, uh, provided them with quite extraordinary and, and wide-ranging powers of investigation. So we're going to first cover the, the scope of the powers, uh, three main statutory powers, then the principles that are applied to Section 236 applications, which is the widest of these powers, and then we'll look at the practical considerations of, of that um, section of the statute. So section 236, uh, this is the, the one that I'm going to focus on. And uh, this provides for court, a court sanctioned investigation by the, by the office holder. And it's been quite neatly summarized by Mr. Justice Buckley in Rolls Razor Limited, um, what the purpose of the section is. Um, and you'll see how it links to the, the duties that I discussed earlier that a liquidator has. Um, and this passage was approved by the House of Lords in the case of British and Commonwealth Holdings, PLC. Um, next, what exactly does it do? Um, 
and who does it apply to? Well, who does it apply to? It, it enables an office holder, uh, liquidators for our purposes, to apply to the court to summon before it uh, any officer of the company. So, for example, past directors or secretaries, uh, or anyone who may have relevant information regarding, and this is very widely set out, the promotion, formation, business, dealings, affairs, or property of the company, uh, or anyone who may in their may in their possession uh, may have in their possession any property of the company, or who are supposed to be indebted to the company. Now, I'll call the targets of these applications examinees, and the court might require an affidavit or the production of books or papers or any other records from the examinee. Um, and more ownishly, the court can also order an examination under oath, and that's provided for in section 237. Uh, what happens if you fail to comply as an examinee uh, with an order under section 236? There's Angela. Um, well, we, uh, we obviously here have uh, quite stringent uh, powers of enforcement, which include um, being able to issue warrants of arrest and also warrant to, to keep in custody the property that might be sought under Section 236. Uh, next, we have Section 235, which provides for a non-judicial investigation by the liquidator. Uh, it imposes a duty to cooperate with the liquidator in any insolvency proceedings related to the company, and it applies to the class of people listed at subsection three. You'll see there. Uh, these include former officers of the company and certain persons who've been in, employed by the company. Now, the, the two things that are quite noteworthy here. The first is that the duty applies to former liquidators, which can be very useful uh, as a new liquidator um, when a company moves from voluntary liquidation into a compulsory liquidation. Uh, and the second is the term employment is quite widely defined as including employment under a contract for services. And so this, this can include uh, professional advisors. So it's quite a catch-all term there. And the obligations it imposes on examinees are, and that's set out at subsection two there, one, uh, to give effect to the liquidator such inf information, to give to the liquidator such information concerning the company and its promotion, formation, business, dealings, affairs, or property as the office holder may at any time after the commencement of the insolvency proceedings reasonably require, and two, to attend on the liquidator at such times as the latter may reasonably require. So what this power does is it allows the liquidator to very quickly and effectively investigate the company's affairs and try find out where the company's assets are located. Uh, in terms of failure to comply for section 235, Jessica Fletcher again. Well, first it's a criminal offense uh, punishable by a fine for a person to fail to comply with section 235 and their duties, uh, unless they have a reasonable excuse. Um, and also uh, liquidators will also have section 236 applications in their back pocket, which have we seen carry much more serious consequences uh, if there's a failure to comply. Section 234, uh, which is the final section, um, this is the for the delivery and seizure of property to which the company appears to be entitled. And I mean, in my view, it's tangentially an investigatory power since the property sought can include uh, books, papers or records. Uh, and if a company is in compulsory liquidation, there's actually no need to, for a liquidator to apply to the court. They can, they can make a direct request uh, to the examinee. Uh, it's worth noting that if a liquidator has reasonable grounds uh, for believing uh, she was entitled to seize or dispose of a particular item of property, for example, a, a computer, and it turns out actually the computer didn't belong to the company, what you have in, in subsection four there uh, is it provides the liquidator with the protection from liability in respect of any loss or damage caused by the delivery or seizure. Failure to comply. Under section 234, there's actually no sanction. Um, so obviously it's far more powerful uh, to start with your duties under section 235. Uh, and then if you require, you use your powers under 236 if you're a liquidator. Um, now the principles that apply to section 236, because that's the section I'm going to be focusing on in terms of the real meaty investigatory power. So the central question that a liquidator needs to answer is whether the information sought is reasonably required. 
uh, to fulfill her duties. So this is obviously a lower threshold than say specific disclosure applications where the test is one of necessity. And the appropriateness of making a section 236 order has been extensively considered by the courts, uh, largely because it's a, it's a power that's been described as drastic and far reaching uh, by some judges and can be extremely oppressive on the examinee. The interests of liquidators frequently come into conflict with issues of privilege and confidentiality, uh, as well as the impact an order might have on, on the due process and the right to a fair trial in separate civil or criminal proceedings that often follow these sort of orders. So bearing these in mind, uh, the House of Lords in British and Commonwealth Holdings PLC uh, number two affirmed the principles applicable to the court exercising its discretion uh, in, or, uh, in order for an order of discovery of information. And these were summarized in the court below in the Court of Appeal by Lord Justice Gibson. Uh, first, we have uh, the discretion conferred by Section 2362 is an unfettered and a general one. Uh, second, that the discretion nevertheless involves a balancing uh, exercise of the requirements of the office holder, the liquidator in our case, uh, against the possible oppression to the person for whom information is sought. Uh, number three, the power conferred by the section is an extraordinary one whose existence is due to the fact that the office holder usually comes as a stranger to the, to the events. Uh, number four, the power can be used not only to, to main, obtain general information, but to discover facts and documents related to contemplated claims, whether proceedings have been started or not, against the proposed witness or someone connected with him. It's very widely said. Um, the power is directed, no, there's number five, the power is directed to enabling the court to help the office holder to complete uh, her functions as effectively and with as much expedition as possible and to discover with as little expense and as much ease as possible the facts surrounding any possible claim. Uh, number six, uh, great weight is to be given to the views of the office holder who have detailed knowledge of what problems exist and what information uh, she needs. And uh, number seven, sets out the, the matters that will be relevant to the balancing exercise um, I mentioned in, in number two. And first, first, uh, uh, first factor is the case against a former officer will usually be much stronger um, since the former officer owes both a fiduciary duty to the company and a duty under section two, uh, 235 of the Insolvency Act to assist the office holder. Uh, secondly, uh, to ask a third party to expose uh, him or herself by giving information to liability involves an element of oppression. So, um, and then uh, number three, an order for oral examination is more likely to be oppressive than one to produce documents. Um, and then finally, uh, to require a person suspected of wrongdoing to prove the case against himself uh, under oath prior to proceedings being brought is oppressive. Now th there's a very large body of case law which considers the place of privilege and confidentiality and self-incrimination in section 236 applications. Uh, and th that subject's large enough to be dealt with by a separate talk. So I'm not going to go into it today, but um, I have included in, in the PDF that I will be sent out uh, after today's talk, um, some of the headline points to do with, with privilege and confidentiality. So when can we say uh, a court's unlikely to grant an order under Section 236? Well, if there isn't even any prima facie evidence that a substantial case exists, uh, which warrants an investigation, well, or there's no real prospect of recoveries for the benefit of creditors, it's very unlikely that an order is going to be made. Um, an order also won't be made uh, where the liquidator is using Section 236 for, for tactical purposes outside the intended scope uh, of the Act. Um, so here, for example, uh, if a 236 application is made to extract information from a company's former accountants to bring negligence, uh, a negligence claim against them for giving negligent advice. Um, in this example, no company assets have been secreted away by the accountants and the court might well view a section 236 application in those circumstances as an abusive process. And that was touched on um, by Lord Justice Scott as he was in Sussy Finance. Um, now, in spite of what's mentioned uh, at paragraph four uh, up on the screen, a more recent case law has shown that in general, an order won't be made where a firm decision has been made to initiate proceedings against the examinee or where proceedings have already been initiated. 
uh, obviously there'll be exceptions, for example, where the intended examinee is the only realistic source of information for the liquidator's inquiries. Uh, and finally, we'll move on to practical considerations. Um, now, the, the detailed procedures relating to court applications and applications under Section 236 are set out in the 2016 rules at 1217 to 1222. Um, can Section 236 applications be ex parte? Uh, absolutely. But those applications should only be done when the circumstances for doing so are compelling. So, for example, where documents are urgently required, uh, where the examinees thought to have been involved in a large scale fraud, or the request for documents by the liquidator have been ignored, and uh, there's a risk that the documents might be disposed of uh, if the application was to be on notice. Uh, not only does there have to be a good reason. Um, for making an ex parte application, but it's extremely important to remember the applicant's duty to make full and frank disclosure. Now, extraterritorial effect, which is uh, a hot topic. Uh, that's uh, Jessica Fletcher on an aeroplane, no doubt, heading to some offshore jurisdiction and finding a murder on the aeroplane. Uh, now, we know from a court of appeal case uh, in 1998 called uh, Mideast Trading, that the court can order documents from outside of the jurisdiction uh, under a Section 236 order. Uh, but in that case, the respondents were actually within the jurisdiction, it just it, the documents weren't. Um, but what about when Section 236 orders uh, are made against an examinee who's not based within the jurisdiction? Now, there've been a string of high court decisions in recent years, and they are entirely conflicting. And it's an issue that really needs a definitive answer from the Supreme Court. Uh, much of the confusion stems from a court of appeal case called Tucker. Um, and that case was decided under Section 25 of the Bankruptcy Act 1914, um, which as applied in bankruptcy is sim quite similar in substance to Sections 236 and 237 of the Insolvency Act. Now, the latest decision um, in the string of cases is given by Lord Justice, uh, by, uh, Lord Justice Voss, who's currently the Lord Chancellor of the High Court, uh, soon actually to be master of the roles. Uh, and that's the case of Accurate. Now, this was a case concerning an application under Section 236, where the respondents to the application were uh, two companies incorporated in Italy. And after a thorough summary of the precedents, uh, the Chancellor of the High Court held that he was bound by the Court of Appeal decision in Tucker uh, to uh, to find that the insolvency, Section 236 of the Insolvency Act doesn't have extraterritorial effect. Um, there might be some obit comments in the Chancellor's judgment, and I've, I've put it there on the right of the screen, that suggest that Tucker might have been wrongly decided. Uh, so if anyone here is acting for a liquidator who has a, a case along these lines, there, there's certain, certainly hints of a judicial tailwind for you. Um, in any event, the Chancellor found that there was an exception uh, to the general rule against extraterritorial effect, and that's where the insolvency regulation applies. So where respondent parties within the EU. Uh, this conclusion was quite fairly straightforward to, to reach because the CJU jurisprudence is clear that uh, the 2000 insolvency regulation can and does extend to territoriality of uh, domestic insolvency provisions. Now, who pays? Uh, the final practical issue is who's, uh, who has to pay the cost of complying with Section 236 orders. Uh, and the cost can be extremely high. Uh, it might be that large quantities of documents need to be retrieved and assessed to determine whether they fall within uh, the terms of the Section 236 order. Now, uh, provision is made under Rule 12.22.4 of the Insolvency Rules for a person summoned to attend for examination under Section 236 to be tendered a reasonable sum in respect of traveling expenses incurred in so doing. Uh, the rule concludes with quite a brusque statement, which is, but any other costs falling on him are at the court's discretion. And the courts have been cautious when using this discretion. And that's because it, in principle, the courts maintain that compliance with an order under section 236 is a public duty in aid of the administration of justice, which should be performed without expectation of compensation, save in exceptional circumstances. 
Uh, and I think that's actually quite a good note to end on because it summarizes just how significant a liquidator's powers of investigation are and the strong support that the courts are willing to give to liquidators trying to fulfill their duties. Um, if you have any questions, please, uh, as, as Phil said, um, don't hesitate to ask in, in the breakout room um, if you want to join my room. And uh, otherwise, I'll now hand over to Emily Moore. Hi, everyone. Um, I am going to present my segment now on claims against uh, directors and third parties. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, <clears throat> so this is a really, really large area. Um, and so I'm going to be providing essentially a, a kind of high level whistle stop tour of each of these main claims. And um, so misfeasance, wrongful trading, fraudulent trading, transactions at an undervalue and preferences, which are all causes of action under the Insolvency Act. Uh, and then a very brief look at dishonest assistance and knowing receipt and an even briefer look at the economic torts and um, just to, to make you aware that those are available and can often overlap um, with the causes of action under the Act. So, as I said, high level, I'm not going to go into detail about procedure and that sort of thing, um, because that would take too long. Um, but it's really just to make you all aware, if you're not already aware, um, of the kind of key ingredients um, and features of these causes of action. So let's start with misfeasance. And I've popped up the, the relevant section of the Act, which is section 212. Um, not for you all to, to read that right now, obviously there's a lot of text, um, but just so that it's there, you can see sort of how many subsections it has, what it looks like. Um, and <clears throat> this is the section that applies to companies in liquidation. Um, but then at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a note there relating to companies in administration. And so in that event, um, you need to look at paragraph 75 of Schedule B1 to the Act. Um, but for present purposes, I'm just going to be looking at, at 212, um, which is the, the liquidation one. So misfeasance, first of all, what, what can constitute misfeasance? So essentially, there are three subcategories. So the first is the misappropriation or retention of money or property of a company. Secondly, becoming accountable for money or other property of a company. And thirdly, breaching a fiduciary or another kind of duty that's owed to the company. And um, so pretty broad, it can encompass a lot of different types of conduct. Um, and I'll be looking at a couple of those um, in the next few slides. Um, so who can a misfeasance, mis misfeasance claim, I beg your pardon, be brought against? Um, so three main categories. Um, firstly, if you're an officer or a former officer of the company, um, you can have a misfeasance claim brought against you. An officer is defined in Section 251 of the Act um, as a director. Um, but a brief note um, that it can apply uh, also to de facto directors. Um, so that's a person who acts as a director without being formally appointed as a director. And then the preferred view is that it does not apply to shadow directors. And um, so shadow directors are people who uh, give directions or instructions to directors and um, that those directors then act in accordance with, but they aren't actually directors themselves. Um, and that is defined in the act. I think that's in one of my, my following slides. And then as well as officers, we've got um, liquidators or administrative receivers and any person who has taken part in the promotion, formation or management of the company. And then who can bring a misfeasance claim? So a number of different people can. Um, you've got liquidators, you've got creditors, contributaries, uh, which is defined by Section 79 as, and um, this is a shortened definition, but, but essentially every person liable to contribute to the assets of a company in the event of it being wound up. And then you've also got the, the official receiver. So um, I mentioned fiduciary duty um, as one, as one of the areas um, of conduct um, under the umbrella of misfeasance. So I've set out there just very briefly um, the seven general duties under sections 171 to 177 of the Companies Act. And um, so very briefly, um, the duty to act within the company's powers, um, to promote the success of the company, to exercise independent judgment, to exercise reasonable care, skill and diligence, to avoid conflicts of interest, 
to not accept benefits from third parties and to declare an interest in a proposed transaction or arrangement. So looking at one of those in a little bit more detail. So the, the section 172 duty to act in good faith in the interests of the company is largely regarded as the core duty of a company director. And I've inserted there a brief citation from the Madoff Securities case, which is a 2013 High Court case, um, where the court commented that a director owes duties to the company to inform himself of the company's affairs and join with his fellow directors in supervising them. It's therefore a breach of duty for a director to allow himself to be dominated, bamboozled or manipulated by a dominant fellow director where such involves a total abrogation of responsibility. So that's just to give a flavour um, of what that core duty really means. And then very briefly, the test. It is subjective, but in circumstances where the company director has failed to address their mind to the question of whether a transaction is in the interests of the company, in those circumstances, an objective test is applied. And that is essentially um, whether an honest and intelligent person um, in that position um, could, in all of the circumstances, have reasonably believed that the transaction was for the company's benefit. And then away from fiduciary duties, um, we've got sort of bog standard negligence. And um, so the wording of the act, any other duty uh, is broad enough to include um, ordinary negligence. So breach of a duty of care. And obviously that duty has to be owed specifically to the company. There's a quick example there and um, the case of Re Dejan of London Limited. And in essence, a company's office was destroyed by a fire. And um, as a result of the director not filling in um, the insurance forms properly, um, the company was uninsured. And as a result, it, it, it became insolvent. And um, so in that circumstance, the liquidator brought a misfeasance action against the director and um, using section 212. Um, and said that the director had been negligent in not filling out the forms properly. Um, and just a brief um, comment there on the standard of care, it's determined not only subjectively, um, but also on general objective criteria as well. So <clears throat> again, briefly, um, the remedies, so essentially um, the court can order the, the person who's been misfeasant to repay, restore or account for any misappropriated money or property with interest um, or provide compensation. And then the limitation period, it's usually six years beginning on the date that the misfeasance occurred, um, but also um, be aware of section 21 of the Limitation Act um, which has the effect of stopping the clock um, in circumstances where there's been fraud or concealment. So moving swiftly on, I said this was going to be a whistle stop tour and it definitely is, um, to wrongful trading, um, which is two sections forward in the Act, so section 214. Um, and this is the first bit of the Act, uh, the section, and that's the second bit, again, not to read now, but I think these slides will be available for distribution, um, if that would be helpful after, after this, the webinar. Um, and at the bottom there, um, I just highlighted again, there's an equivalent for companies in administration. This is the section that applies um, in liquidation, and that is section 246ZB, um, which um, to all intents and purposes is, is identical to, to 214. Now, who can be liable? So it's directors or former directors. Um, this, this section does include shadow directors. It probably includes de facto directors and, and the key is that they have to have been the director at what is called the moment of truth, which I'll go on to explain in just a moment. And it, to have standing to bring um, this type of application, um, you need to be a liquidator. Uh, so the moment of truth um, is, and this is set out um, in terms in section 214, it's when the defendant knew or ought to have concluded that there was no reasonable prospect and um, that the company would, would avoid going into insolvent liquidation, um, but nevertheless continued, continued to trade at that time. And the meaning of insolvent liquidation is when the assets are insufficient for the payment of the company's debts and other liabilities. 
And that is judged from the perspective of a reasonably diligent person having regard to, and I've set out that the factors there are A and B. And then at C there is um, another, another requirement that the defendant has failed to take every step with a view to minimizing the potential loss to the company's creditors. And that is, if I just go back in the act, so it's sec subsection three, and um, it's basically, it's a statutory defense. And um, so if the director can demonstrate um, that they did take every step with a view to minimizing the potential loss, um, then that's essentially a, a get out clause for wrongful trading. Um, Moving on to remedies, so the remedy, the definition of, of the remedy is pretty broad, so the, the court can declare that the person is to be liable to make such contribution to the company's assets as the court thinks proper. And there is what is largely termed the increase in net deficiency requirement, which is sometimes the, the criteria of wrongful trading that makes it quite difficult to, to prove and to quantify. Um, because you essentially have to measure the increase in the company's net deficiency of assets over the relevant period. So that's from the moment of truth, as I just alluded to, up until the time when the company goes into insolvent liquidation. And um, so that can, as I said, make, make, thing, make it difficult to quantify the claim because, for example, um, if the company director hasn't been keeping proper records, um, it can be impossible to identify the precise extent of that increase in the, um, the, the net deficiency um, because of, well, because there's no records in place and, and it's impossible to tell. And um, so it can be quite a problematic um, cause of action. And um, what is the limitation period? Again, it's six years and that begins when the winding up order is made. Um, and just to, to highlight briefly, I'm sure um, those watching are well aware that um, in light of the pandemic, um, wrongful trading um, provisions were temporarily suspended between the 1st of March and the 30th of September. Um, and I'm, I don't think we, we we're unsure at the moment as to whether those measures are going to be extended. Um, but that was clearly um, to, to allow directors to operate their businesses through the pandemic um, without the threat of personal liability. Um, so that's just a, a brief note on that um, in terms of the pandemic. <clears throat> Moving swiftly on to fraudulent trading. So here we're going back a section in the Act to 213. And I'm not going to spend long on this. And um, that's the, the, the section there on the screen, and it, it really speaks for itself. So um, if in the course of the winding up of a company, it appears that any business of the company has been carried on with the intent to defraud creditors, um, of the company or of any other person or for any fraudulent purpose, the following has effect. And the courts can on the application of the liquidator declare that any persons who were knowingly parties to the carrying on of the business in the manner described, and um, they will be liable to make such contributions to the company's assets as the court thinks proper. And then again, there's an equivalent section for companies in administration, um, which is section 246ZA, again, virtually identical to, to this section. And just a few key points, as I said, I won't go into as much detail about fraudulent trading, um, as well as the civil liability under 213. And um, you've also got criminal liability under section 993 of the Companies Act. Um, a person guilty of fraudulent trading can be made subject to a disqualification order. And um, this type of action is brought by a liquidator. And the key point to note, really, the key difference between um, 213 and 214 is that it, it, it's fraudulent trading um, affects essentially accessories as well. It's an ac accessorial liability type of section. So any persons who were knowingly parties to the carrying on of the business. So that can extend to the holding company, to creditors, to banks. Um, and um, I'll be drawing a brief parallel when I go on to talk about dishonest assistance as well, because there's quite a lot of similarity um, with that. And um, so it is a higher threshold because obviously you're having to prove dishonesty, um, but applications can be brought for wrongful trading and fraudulent trading at the same time. So moving on to the two reviewable transactions that I'll be looking at. So firstly, transactions at an undervalue and known as TUVs. 
Um, so this is section 238. Um, again, not to be read through now, um, but just for, for ease of reference. Um, so who has standing to bring an application um, under 238? Um, you need to be a liquidator or an administrator. And um, the key with this section is the relevant time, which is defined in, in section 2240. So essentially th there's two components to the relevant time. So the transaction in question needs to have been entered into during the two years before the onset of insolvency. And at that time, the company needs to have been unable to pay its debts at the time of the transaction, or it, it became unable to pay its debts as a result of the transaction. So that's the insolvency requirement. And then there is reference to the so-called connected person um, element. So where the transaction in question was made with a connected person, um, and I've set out there at the last bullet point on this slide, um, a connected person is defined in the Act as a director, a shadow director, an associate of a director uh, or a shadow director or an associate of the company. So if the transaction is made with, with one of those, then there's a presumption that the company was insolvent at that time. And then I'm not going to read all of these out, but that's just to illustrate um, essentially the, the types of orders that can be made on an application under Section 238. Um, so, for example, um, just going back to the Act quickly um, to find the bit that I wanted to find. Um, yes, yeah, so essentially looking at subsection 4, so the definition of a transaction at an undervalue. Um, is set out there as either the company makes a gift to the person or enters into a transaction with the person on terms that provide for the company to receive no consideration, or the company enters into a transaction with the person for a consideration, the value of which in money or money's worth is significantly less than the value in money or money's worth of the consideration provided by the company. So if, if either of those situations arises, so for example, in the case of a property being transferred, um, then the order that the court would make would be an order that that property be transferred and, and be revested in the company from the person that it had been transferred to. Um, so I won't read out the rest of those potential orders, but they're, they're set out um, in the Act, Section 241, and they're, they're fairly self-explanatory. Um, and show that the, the remedies are pretty, pretty all encompassing. And then the limitation period for this one is a little bit more tricky because it depends on the type of remedy and um, that you're seeking. So if you're seeking a non pecuniary right, so like the example I just gave with the property being transferred and you're, you're trying to get the property to be revested in the company, and then that type of application is treated as an action on a specialty and it has a 12 year limitation period under Section 8 of the Limitation Act. But where you're seeking a sum of money and um, then it's six year um, limitation period and where there's any doubt as to the appropriate category I've just set out um, the, 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 the case law on that. Essentially, you look at the substance or the essential nature of the relief being asked. Um, to determine whether it's 12 years or, or six years. So moving swiftly on, I won't detain everyone too long as we're meant to have our first break um, around now, um, but preferences. Um, so a lot of similarities with transactions at an undervalue. Um, so essentially, um, sec subsection four here is the key. So a company gives a preference to a person if, that person is one of the company's creditors or a surety or guarantor for any of the company's debts or other liabilities. And the company does anything or suffers anything to be done, which has the effect of putting that person into a position which, in the event of the company going into liquidation, will be better than the position that he would have been in if that thing had not been done. Um, so that's pretty self-explanatory. And then, very briefly, uh, so you need to be a liquidator or an administrator to bring an application under this section. Um, I've set out the, the, the test for essentially when a preference is given already, and that's set out in the Act. And the relevant time for preferences is slightly different to transactions at an undervalue. 
Um, so the appropriate criteria to determine the, the, the time is whether the, the party is connected. And um, so if they are connected, then it's you're looking at two years of the onset of within within the onset of insolvency. And if it's not a connected party, then it's within six months of the ins onset of insolvency. And you've got the same um, criteria as before that at that time, um, the company is unable to pay its debts or becomes unable to pay its debts in consequence of the preference. Um, and then there's a short slide here on the necessary desire. Um, essentially, the, the, the company has to have been influenced um, by a desire to put the person who receives the preference into a position which, in the event of the company going into liquidation, will be better than the position that they would have been in otherwise. Um, the giving of the preference has to actually have that effect. Um, and there's a presumption, again, um, in relation to connected persons, that if the preference is given to a connected person, um, then the company was influenced by that desire. Uh, it doesn't have to be the dominant intention. Um, it's just necessary that the company is influenced by this, this type of desire. So very briefly, I have three um, short further slides um, on dishonest assistance and knowing receipt, um, and then a brief summary of, of the economic torts. So dishonest assistance, so we're moving away from the act here. Um, you have to prove four things, very simply, that there was a trust, that there was a breach of the trust, um, for example, by a company director, and that there was a third party who assisted in the breach of trust and that they did so dishonestly. Um, the test, so I said there was a parallel with 213, so fraudulent trading, um, is essentially um, similar in terms of it, it's a secondary liability um, type cause of action. Um, and essentially there needs to be conduct which assists the commission of the relevant breach of trust, um, and it has to be conduct that is of more than minimal importance. Uh, and essentially, um, there needs to have been positive steps taken by that um, secondary party um, in the carrying on of the business in a fraudulent manner. So that's a very, very simple definition of, of dishonest assistance, just to show that it's there. Knowing receipt, obviously, um, most people are probably aware of this. I mean, it is what, what it says on the tin. The emphasis is on actually receiving um, property in a breach of trust. Um, and it's property that was held um, subject to a trust or subject to a fiduciary duty. Um, so if the first four of these um, criteria that are on the screen right now, if they are satisfied, then the defendant is a constructive trustee of the trust property um, and there's an equitable proprietary remedy. Um, but if all six are satisfied, so in addition to the first four, if the receipt is for the defendant's own benefit, and they've received the property with knowledge that it is trust property and that it has been transferred in breach of trust. So there's, a, there's the knowledge element. Uh, then there's also a personal equitable remedy against the recipient. So that, again, is a very, very brief um, overview. And then finally, um, just not going into any detail on each of these, but just making the audience aware that they are available. So the economic torts, procuring a breach of contract, intimidation, causing loss by unlawful means, and then probably I think conspiracy is the one that most people will already be familiar with. Two types, unlawful means and lawful means, um, and yeah, without going into any detail on those, it's just useful to be aware that they're, they're available, that they often overlap with some of the causes of action um, that I've just been through, um, just so people, people don't forget about them, um, basically. And um, that concludes my very rushed whistle stop tour um, and I think I'm handing back to Helen now and um, just before we go for our break. Thank you very much Phil, Daniel and Emily and thank you to our audience for sticking with us. Hi everybody welcome back I was just about to say very nice to speak to those who were in my room um, and we were cut off. So I think we've been joined by a few more people from Three Hair Court now um, hopefully fresh back from the Supreme Court. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce the next speakers who are going to be um, Sam, Daniel and Hannah. At the end of those three webinars, we should have a, another breakout room 
Um, so, but please, if you're um, feeling in the need for a caffeine injection, feel free to run off, make yourself a coffee at any point uh, and join us again. Because I know this is a particularly long session that we're doing today. Um, with no further ado then, um, I'll pass over to Sam. Um, so again, we have uh, a big topic with lots of ground to cover. Uh, don't be panicked if you see a big block of statute or a big list of cases through this, because like Emily, I'm not going to be um, reading that out. That's for you to come back to uh, if you found it interesting or want to refer to it at some point. So first I'll highlight a few of the themes of insolvency um, and sort of place, uh, sorry, a, a few themes of administration and sort of place it in insolvency. Um, and then uh, just go through its features and uh, look at their effects and practice. So um, I suppose a description um, of, insol of uh, administration would be uh, an insolvency process where a company is placed under the control of an insolvency practitioner uh, and protected by a moratorium in order to rescue the company or realize its assets. Uh, I mean, one thing to note about administration is that it's not a standalone procedure. It's not something that um, can really be used uh, uh, alone because it's a, a transitive process uh, and not something um, uh, that, that can, uh, on its own, uh, produce a restructuring. Uh, so it doesn't have all of the tools necessary to achieve a company reorganization. Um, it gives the company time to achieve a reorganization through uh, some other method. So that could be a CVA, scheme of arrangement or uh, some other negotiated outcome or a li uh, liquidation. Um, so uh, I think it's quite helpful to think about why administration was created uh, and what it was intended to do in order to really understand what it does now, um, particularly given that administration, which was uh, sort of thought about and created in the 80s, is quite a young procedure when you consider that other insolvency procedures like receivership um, are well over 100 years old. So um, administration was created in uh, following a, a 1982 government review into English insolvency, uh, and they found a few problems with it. Uh, most of all, that there were only two procedures in English insolvency at the time, and those were liquidation and receivership. Uh, the result is that there was no procedure uh, in English insolvency uh, it, it, that, that had the goal of rescuing uh, a company or rescuing a business. Uh, and as a result, a lot of going concern value in the economy was being lost when businesses that were viable but facing temporary financial distress uh, were uh, and unable to reorganize uh, uh, with a sort of protective sheltering around them. Um, that other jurisdictions allowed. So it might, uh, at first, um, uh, the procedure of receivership uh, might look like it's, it, it was suited to rescuing a business, and this did exist in the 80s, um, but actually it was not intended to rescue a business and would be quite poorly suited to it. Uh, so receivership is not a procedure uh, designed to rescue a company in financial distress. Uh, the receiver is uh, acting on behalf of the qualified uh, of the floating charge holder uh, and given extensive powers over a company's affair uh, uh, affairs, but is given them in order to realize the value of a company's assets uh, to repay the floating charge holder. So although a receiver is an outside uh, practitioner who comes in to take charge of a company uh, and uh, administer its affairs, uh, they do not have the goal of reorganization. Um, so uh, uh, certain um, uh, features of receivership are that they often uh, result in liquidation. Uh, that liquidation often happens at the expense of unsecured creditors, the company, other stakeholders, uh, and the receiver owes very limited duties to the company. Um, but that said, uh, administration, when it was created, did borrow certain ideas from receivership. So uh, much like receivership, an outside practitioner is brought in to oversee the company's affairs. Um, and the benefit in that in, in the court report in 1982 was, was seen as being that if you had uh, management that were ineffective or for some other reason contributed to uh, a company's insolvency, having an outside expert come in uh, to balance the books uh, was worthwhile, particularly if they were given extensive powers over the company. 
Um, another place that uh, uh, policymakers look to for examples of a procedure to rescue companies was Chapter 11 in the United States Bankruptcy Code, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, so uh, this is a procedure that is quite different to administration. It's not a practitioner in possession procedure, it's a debtor in, in uh, uh, possession procedure. So uh, an outside expert is not brought in, it's the company's management who remain, uh, but they are given um, an extensive shielding in the form of a moratorium uh, or an automatic stay, depending on uh, which jurisdiction you're in. Um, and uh, they, uh, the, the automatic stay is, much, is, is, very, is very extensive now and was then. Um, so that is sort of the background to, um, to administration and why it was brought in. It was brought in uh, to fill this vacuum that existed um, uh, of a procedure in English insolvency to rescue uh, businesses or rescue companies. Um, uh, administration was then uh, reformed in some quite important ways in 2002, uh, largely because a lot of people were not using it um, who could have. Uh, it was cumbersome and quite expensive uh, because originally an administrator could only be appointed by the court um, and the process of administration uh, uh, required a lot of court oversight, which obviously is expensive and takes a lot of time. Um, administration could also uh, before the Enterprise Act be bypassed by a floating charge holder uh, inserting a, uh, uh, a receiver in uh, uh, who obviously would owe duties to them and not to uh, the company. Um, so administration today is um, uh, a result of <clears throat> uh, uh, the changes of the Administration Act as well as the original provisions of the, uh, sorry, of the Enterprise Act as well as the original provisions of the Insolvency Act that created it. Uh, and today it's largely found in Schedule B1 uh, of the Insolvency Act. Uh, so, sorry. Um, so uh, entering administration. So the uh, Insolvency Act at Schedule B1 uh, provides three ways for entering administration via court order. So that was, you know, as it was before the Enterprise Act. Um, but it can now be done also uh, through appointment by a qualifying uh, floating charge holder uh, and also by appointment by the company or its directors. Um, again, I'm not going to read uh, through these. You can um, come back to them if you find them interesting. Uh, so the Enterprise Act, uh, interestingly, also codified exit routes from administration, um, which seems like an obvious thing to do now. But actually, at the, at the time before the Administration Act, Sorry, before the uh, Ent uh, Enterprise Act, uh, administration, uh, uh, there was no clear route out of administration. And there was a lot of litigation uh, over uh, when a company could lead a, uh, leave administration um, and a lot of court supervision, uh, su supervision ensuring that companies left uh, administration properly. So uh, here again are, are the current ways that uh, administration can be exited. Um, and they include, uh, so, uh, an automatic end date one year from the commencement of administration, um, which obviously gets rid of any ambiguity as to when, um, absent other circumstances, administration ends. Um, there are also a number of other ways, so um, conversion into a, into a creditor's voluntary liquidation or um, via court order. Um, but, uh, but you can come back to these if, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, this is something that really changed under the Enterprise Act, the statutory objectives of administration. Um, so administration was given codified statutory objectives um, that the administrator had to uh, adhere to, and um, they broadly uh, correspond to the following. So uh, 3.1a uh, corresponds to a rescue of the company as a corporate entity. 3.1b uh, corresponds to the rescue of um, all or part of the business, uh, and 3.1c uh, is effectively liquidation. Um, and what the statutory scheme does is it requires um, and it, it, it requires a hierarchy, a hierarchy of um, uh, of objectives. So um, an, an administrator is obliged to um, attempt to pursue uh, to pursue 3.1a. Uh, uh, to consider pursuing 3.1a before considering the other statutory ob objectives. Um, but there are some words in the, in the statute that I would like to take you to, um, just to emphasize some of, some of the issues with it. Um, that's the word thinks uh, at three, uh, 
and thinks at four. So to read it out, the administrator must perform his functions with the objective specified in subparagraph 1A, um, that's rescuing the company, um, unless he thinks either that it is not reasonably practical to achieve that objective or that the objective specified in subparagraph 1B would achieve a better result for the company's creditors as a whole. Um, and you can, you can imagine when attempting to um, hold administrator to account for a decision, how difficult it is um, to prove that an administrator did not think something was reasonably practical. So the words thinks and uh, reasonably in conjunction um, really cause quite a few problems when trying to um, uh, hold administrators to account for choosing what, what someone might perceive to be the wrong objective. Um, and uh, that goes also for subsection uh, four. So um, if you're a, uh, a company uh, uh, or, or uh, a, a shareholder trying to prove that um, an administrator uh, uh, should, have cons should have pursued the rescue of a business rather than liquidation, uh, you're going to face quite an uphill battle. Um, which leads on to the next topic of uh, accountability of administrators. So this is something that Emily touched on in her presentation, um, in that there, there are three main ways in which an administrator's co uh, administrator can be uh, challenged. Um, uh, that is um, challenge of the administrator's conduct of the company under paragraph 74 um, of the schedule. Uh, challenge uh, under misfeasance um, and uh, attempting to get a court order to remove an administrator um, from office. So on the face of it, there, there, is, there are mechanisms to hold administrators accountable, um, but the following are some cases where um, uh, an administrator was challenged under these sections. Um, and uh, in none of them uh, were, uh, was, the, uh, uh, was the challenge successful um, for various reasons. Um, partly uh, because um, uh, it's, you know, this is not a straightforward professional negligence uh, claim, um, the, and which in any case, you know, it might not be that straightforward, um, but the courts are incredibly reluctant uh, to challenge an administrator's commercial judgment um, you know, courts are obviously reluctant to challenge directors' commercial judgments too, but um, you, you see here in um, Re Lehman Brothers 2009, um, uh, the court stated that it would go against the nature and purpose of administration if the court wanted to interfere with the day-to-day -day management of the administration, um, and an administrator's conduct would need to be plainly wrong to be successfully challenged. Um, so I'll leave here. I'll make sure that the um, I, I put the citation, the full citations in for these cases as well. If anyone wants to um, come back to them, um, but this is just to illustrate that um, challenging an administrator is not straightforward. Um, now, an important feature of administration generally is the moratorium, um, which um, prohibits um, what you can see here: the winding up of the company, taking steps to enforce any security. Um, uh, 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 or um, uh, peaceable re-entry uh, legal processes. Um, and it was, ex uh, the Enterprise Act extended um, the moratorium to cover um, supply, what it saw at the time to be essential services. Um, a few in interesting important things to note as well um, is that this moratorium is often a reason why administration is pursued rather than other uh, insolvency procedures like CBAs or um, uh, negotiations that are not formal insolvency procedures. Uh, also, under English law, the moratorium uh, does not prevent parties from using set-off. Um, that's quite unusual, actually, as a jurisdiction. I don't think, uh, well, Germany and the United States do not have the same view of, uh, of set-off. So that is, that is quite an unusual feature uh, of um, uh, English uh, set-off and insolvency. Um, and uh, an application can be made to the courts to lift the moratorium uh, and permission to lift the moratorium can also be made to the administrator uh, and uh, case law, particularly the case of Atlantic Computers, which is the leading case on this, um, suggests that uh, either the court or the administrator 
um, has to undertake quite a careful balancing exercise, considering um, the potential prejudice um, that uh, uh, could be suffered uh, by the individual under the moratorium um, and the collective rights uh, of creditors. Um, there were some recent, very recent important changes to um, the moratorium and administration as well um, under the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, uh, which really helps with uh, what can be known as ransom creditors. And this is something that has been on the reform agenda for some time. Uh, and that is that uh, where a company has entered insolvency or, re or a restructuring process, which includes administration for our purposes, uh, or obtains a new company moratorium, uh, the company's suppliers are not able to rely on contractual terms to terminate, uh, stop supplying, or vary the contractual terms, uh, contract terms of the company, uh, such as increasing the price of supplies. Uh, the customer is required to pay for any supplies made uh, once it is in the company moratorium or insolvency process, but is not required to pay outstanding amounts due for past supplies while it is arranging its rescue plan. There are a few important things to note about this new change. Um, it is a big uh, increase in protection for companies in administration uh, compared with those under the original Insolvency Act and under the Enterprise Act. Um, but it's perhaps less generous than it first seems uh, in that it only uh, targets upstream contracts and not downstream contracts. So um, uh, to give an example, uh, if you are a business um, uh, uh, buying supplies, essential supplies, um, this legislation will protect you. This legislation will not protect you from customers who now refuse to buy uh, your goods or services as a result of your uh, insolvency. So it sort of half protects um, uh, companies in administration. Um, this can be quite interestingly contrasted to uh, the moratorium under uh, under Chapter 11 in the United States, um, which not only uh, bans ipso facto clauses, i.e. clauses that uh, end a contract due to the fact of a company's insolvency. Uh, under American Chapter 11, a company is also entitled to pick and choose its own contracts and uh, ditch the uh, non-profitable ones. Uh, uh, of its own volition. So, for example, if a company in Chapter 11 uh, had a contract to sell uh, oil at $50 a barrel and the price of oil during the administration goes up to $60 a barrel, it can ditch that original contract and look for a new buyer of its oil. Um, so, compared to international comparisons uh, or you know, equivalent uh, processes in other countries uh, and compared to what it could be, um, this uh, change to the legislation is perhaps less generous uh, than it seems uh, at first. Um, and that might be a good place to end. My name is Hannah and I'm going to be giving the fifth talk in today's series on CVAs. Um, I'm going to be giving you a whistle-stop tour on the basics of CVAs. So I'll be covering what is a CVA and its purpose, what entities are eligible for a CVA, the procedure for a CVA and finally, um, which is particularly topical at the moment, challenges to a CVA. So firstly, at its most basic, without teaching you all to suck eggs, what is a CVA? A company voluntary arrangement is a procedure that may help a company to address its financial difficulties. It is a compromise or other arrangement between a company and its creditors under part one of the Insolvency Act. A CVA binds all unsecured creditors of a company if the necessary majority of creditors vote in favor of the proposals by way of a decision procedure. However, a CVA does not affect the rights of secured creditors or preferential creditors unless they agree to the proposals explicitly. The purpose of a CVA is intended to allow companies to avoid potential terminal insolvency proceedings by coming to a binding agreement or compromise with their unsecured creditors. Typically, a proposal for a CVA will include a rescheduling or reducing of the company's debts, but one of the main benefits of a CVA is its flexibility. CVAs may also be used to help implement a compromise between the debtor company and its creditors 
whilst the company is being administered through a formal insolvency procedure, such as administration, which Sam has just taken you through. Now, what entities are eligible for a CVA if you're thinking of entering into one? This is set out in section one sub four sub A of the Insolvency Act and broadly covers three types of company. A company registered under the Companies Act 2006 in England and Wales or Scotland, a company incorporated in a member state of the EEA, and a company not incorporated in an EAA member state, but having its COMI in an EAA state, except Denmark. However, notably, companies incorporated in Northern Ireland are not eligible for the CVA procedure under the Insolvency Act. They have their own form of the CVA procedure, and this has been, been picked up in the recent monsoon CVA case. Also, if we turn over the slide, we can see that CVAs also apply to limited liability partnerships. But what it doesn't apply to is a unincorporated entity such as a social club. That wouldn't be a company for the purposes of section one sub four. And an example of that is Re Panther v Rowellen Football Social Club. And the citation is given out in the slide if, for example, you are an unincorporated entity and wondering if you have standing to be able to enter into a CVA. So who may propose the CVA? If the relevant company is not in administration or liquidation, generally CVAs are proposed by its directors. However, if you are in administration or liquidation already, it tends to be the administrator or the liquidator that may propose the CVA. And who may be the nominee? A proposal for a CVA should nominate a person to supervise the implementation of the CVA, and they must be a qualified insolvency practitioner. Where an administrator or a liquidator makes a proposal for a CVA, the administrator or the liquidator will normally be the nominee in that case. And the slide I'm most proud of today, and um, showing my clip art skills at its fullest, um, here it sets out the full procedure for a CVA generally. Um, it's quite a complicated process, uh, and I've broken it down in the next couple of slides, but something to revisit in accordance with the rules stated if you are considering entering into such procedure. So firstly, the proposal and statement of affairs. Those proposing the CVA, which we've said is normally the director or administrator or liquidator, prepare the document setting out the proposals, and they normally generally do so with the assistance of the nominee. Then the proposal is delivered to the nominee, and the person making the proposals must also give a statement of the company's affairs containing details of the company's creditors, debts, other liabilities and assets. Now, where the nominee is not a liquidator or an administrator of the company, the nominee must, within 28 days of being given notice of the proposal, submit a report to the court as to whether, in their opinion, the proposal should be considered by the company's creditors and members. Now, generally, as the um, nominee is assisting in the CVA proposal, in all reality, that will be done before the 28 days starts kicking, but it is a tight time limit and, and one to be aware of. And if the nominee thinks that the proposal should go ahead, it has to seek the decision of the company's creditors by way of a decision procedure and a decision of the company's members at a meeting of those members. However, if an administrator or a liquidator is the nominee, then they don't need to report to the court. So the second step, looking at creditors' decision and members' meeting, where the nominee does recommend to the court that they should consider the proposal, the nominee has to seek the creditors' approval by carrying out one of the decision procedures set out in part 15 of the Insolvency Rules 2016. Notice of the procedure must be given to every creditor of the company of whose claim and address the nominee is aware. 
The nominee must also call a members meeting for the date, time and place recommended in the report to the court, unless the court orders otherwise. However, where the nominee is the liquidator or administrator, the nominee can order such a meeting as it sees fit. The members meeting has to take place after the creditor's decision has been made and within five business days following that decision. Now, step three, the all important approval of the CVA. So the creditors and the shareholders of the company decide whether or not to approve the proposed CVA. The golden 75% rule is that the CVA proposal will be implemented if at least 75% by value of the company's creditors who respond in the decision procedure vote for it unless those voting against it include more than 50% by value of all the unconnected creditors whose claims are admitted for voting. The company shareholders can approve the proposals by a simple majority in value. However, if the company's creditors approve the proposal, the CVA will be implemented. So who does that proposal bind? The CVA cannot affect the rights of a secured creditor to enforce its security, except, except with its explicit consent. So unlike preferential creditors, secured creditors cannot vote on a CVA, save to the extent that their debt is unsecured. This effectively means that debt owed to a secured creditor cannot be compromised by a CVA and must be dealt with by direct negotiation or paid in full. A CVA binds all creditors who are entitled to vote in the decision procedure, including dissenting parties, and who would have been entitled to vote if they had notice of the decision procedure. So in reality, this means that a CVA, once it's approved, both binds both known and unknown creditors in relation to debts which the CVA is drafted to encompass. And the final step is how is the CVA fully implemented after it's improved? The approved CVA takes effect from the date when the creditors decide to approve it. Um, on approval of the CVA, the nominee is redesignated as a supervisor of the CVA and is empowered to implement its terms. And in doing so, they are entitled to apply to the court for directions. And the final step for the supervisor is on completion, they must send a final report on the implementation of the proposal to all shareholders and creditors who are bound by the CVA. And that needs to be done within 28 days of the CVA's completion. So that's a quick run through of the procedure for a CVA. And um, the other and final major topic in, in CVAs is, well, if I don't like it, how do I challenge it? Um, now, firstly, looking at the grounds, the two major grounds that are set out in Section 6 of the Insolvency Act in terms of how to challenge it are first, unfair prejudice, and second, material irregularity. First, if we have a brief look at unfair prejudice, this is a question of fact determined on a case-by-case -case basis. A CVA which treats different unsecured creditors in different ways may be prejudicial, but the question of fairness depends on the overall effect of the CVA. And a recent example of this is Prudential Assurance Company Limited and others VPRG Powerhouse Limited in 2007. Now, in that case, um, it's a high court case. This concerned a CVA of a company that was the tenant of a number of leasehold properties. The tenant's parent company guaranteed the tenant's obligations under the various leases. The effect of the CVA proposal was to release the parent company from its obligation under the guarantee. Now, the High Court held that the CVA was clearly prejudicial to the landlords, but the key issue here was whether the prejudice was justifiable in the overall context of the CVA. Uh, and when looking at that question, there was decided that there was no justification for the prejudice in an overall context. And as the CVA didn't offer any compensation to the landlords for the loss of their rights against the parent company guarantor, the CVA was unfairly prejudicial. 
Turning to the other ground of challenge, and this is the material irregularity ground, this is again a question of fact arising out of the conduct of the decision procedure used to consider the CBA proposal. I've noted two cases there. I'm not going to bore you with both, but if it's of particular interest, feel free to go back and look at the citations. Um, Gertner v CLF Finance Limited is a 2018 decision um, and involves an IVA, but again, the principles are transferable. Um, the Discovery Northampton v Debenhams Retail case is quite interesting. Um, the Debenhams Retail CVA of last year being particularly um, notable for, for many reasons, but one of the grounds of challenge was material irregularity. Um, and in that case, the challenge was based on the company's failure to disclose in sufficient detail potential clawback claims that might crystallise if the company went into administration. Um, and that ground failed on the basis that the CVA proposal didn't need to forensically set out such potential claims and it had complied with the legislation in the brief discussion included in the proposal and therefore the challenge wasn't successful. Um, as it's a question of fact, challenges can be quite tricky to establish um, and, and the most recent cases certainly set that out. So if one is considering a challenge, um, it's important to look at recent case law and to see the pitfalls of where other CVA challenges have fell down. Just briefly to note on the time limits, it, it's quite a short time limit. So if you're, if you're going to look at challenging the CVA, you don't want to hang around. Um, it's within 28 days of the CVA's approval by creditors being reported to the court. Or if you're in the case of a creditor who wasn't given notice of the CVA decision within 28 days of the day on which the creditor become aware of the decision procedure having taken place. Um, and I've also noted at the bottom of that slide that there isn't necessarily any procedural impediment to the continuation of challenge proceedings, even when the CVA has been terminated. Um, and Williams v. Carraway Guildford, Guildford, even 2019, was a particularly interesting case. It was a strikeout application. Essentially, the court held that they did have jurisdiction to revoke a CVA even if it had already been terminated, as, as revocation is separate to termination. And finally, just setting out who may apply um, for a challenge, and this is again in Section 6 of the Insolvency Act. And you can see on the screen um, that it's quite a wide standing for who can apply. And but then again, it's not everyone, as the Debenham Retail CVA case highlighted. Um, in that case, a creditor who'd been repaid in full before the CVA vote was not considered a creditor, but could support and fund a challenge to the CVA brought by other creditors who had voted against it. Um, so that's quite important um, generally when looking at sort of the retail industry and considering whether they're going into a CVA. Um, I note at the moment, New Look in particular had their CVA approved last month. And it looks, looking at the Financial Times from yesterday, that there are four separate challenges in that case from different landlords. Um, uh, and looking at standing, it's curious whether a similar situation to that in Debenhams might arise in terms of um, New Look. And that's it from me today and our whistle stop tour on CVAs. Um, thank you for listening to me. Um, on the screen is two recent um, articles from Three Hair Court. Um, due to coronavirus and the times we find ourselves in, CVAs are an increasingly popular um, tool, restructuring tool in the market, and we're writing a series of articles on CVAs. Um, my colleague Richard Bottomley has written an article on the overview of CVAs, and this week I've published an article on CVAs, COVID-19 and rescue culture, looking at um, the standard form COVID-19 CVA published by R3. Um, and I believe there's one on the hot on the press from Ben Channer coming next week. Um, so please, please keep your eyes peeled for that. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Daniel Black for the final talk of today and um, before our final networking session. And this is on schemes of arrangement. Good afternoon. Everyone, I'm Daniel Black, as Hannah has just introduced me as, and I'm going to be talking about schemes of arrangement and restructuring plans. I realise that I am uh, quite late uh, in the day in terms of joining everyone, but 
I thought it would be would nonetheless be useful to, to have a look at both of these topics. So initially, uh, the, the point to look at is schemes of arrangement and the fundamentals of them. Now, what I propose to look at here is, is their key features, their, their procedural stages, uh, as well as their uh, requirements coming uh, ultimately to the court's role uh, and, and use this as a basis to illuminate uh, our investigation uh, of the new restructuring uh, plan. So in terms of, of what a scheme of arrangement uh, is, it's a statutory procedure rather under part 26 uh, of the Companies Act, whereby a company can make a compromise or an arrangement with its members or creditors or indeed with any class of them. Now, it's important always to remember in this uh, context uh, that the legislation does not prescribe uh, the possible subject means to which uh, you can use this mechanism. Thus, for example, you can use it for group reorganizations, for acquisitions, for demergers, uh, and, and many other uh, matters as well. But the key point, the key conditioning criterion, uh, if you wish to think of it that way, is that you can do it for these exercises insofar as they concern companies. And that's because part 26 makes clear that a company must be a party to this type of arrangement. So therefore the question is raised, what is a company? Uh, well, that's identified for us in section uh, 8952 of the Companies Act, which provides that company means any company are liable to be wound up under the Insolvency Act 1986. And what this means is that it can apply to unregistered companies and it can also apply to foreign companies. Uh, and that's by virtue of section 221 of the Insolvency Act. Now you've noticed uh, I've mentioned foreign companies and necessarily we have to keep our, our heads um, in the game for potential complexities in that regard. And I currently, uh, and currently remains a loaded word, but, but currently the courts um, are increasingly requiring English company applicants uh, to address the jurisdictional issues raised by the Brussels and recast regulation. And I say currently uh, is a loaded word because of course, uh, the United Kingdom's position with respect to uh, jurisdiction uh, and, and enforcement of judgments and the legal basis for those it is likely to be subject to change uh, and very quickly. So that's certainly something uh, to keep uh, one's eye out for. What's the next point to consider uh, and what's inherent in the nature of these arrangements is that they're a court approval mechanism. Uh, and the effect of that is such that a court will have to be satisfied. Uh, and generally speaking, in respect of the arrangement, uh, a court would have to be satisfied that it was fair and that it was reasonable uh, and that it represented a genuine attempt uh, to reach agreement between the company and its creditors and or its uh, members. And this is why um, you may have heard it, it said that there must be a genuine and effective arrangement or compromise to be uh, reached. Now, the upshot is that this means that members and creditors of the company who participate in the scheme, they must obtain some advantage, uh, some advantage that compensates them for the scheme's alterations of their rights and you can see on the screen that a scheme which simply expropriates the rights of the members or the creditors is not going to be a compromise or an agreement. But it is important uh, at this point to say something about the wider context of the restructuring uh, and this can form part and indeed does form part of a court's uh, deliberations in terms of establishing whether there is a genuine compromise, compromise rather, or agreement on the table. So for example, in the Blue uh, Brook case, the High Court considered three schemes of arrangement um, to release creditors' claims against three group companies. And this was part of a wider arrangement in respect of, of the group companies, uh, and the court was attentive to the broader circumstances in those respects. Now, in terms of the procedure, uh, there are other ways to cut the cake, but, but as you can see, I've broken it down into five steps there to correspond with, with the five controlling sections of uh, the Act. Uh, 
Now, life begins for schemes of arrangement uh, with an application in the company's court uh, for an order to summon a meeting of the relevant class or classes of members or creditors in any such member that the court, uh, manner rather, that the court may direct. You can see on screen there, um, any of the following parties are available um, and competent to apply for an order. But one thing that we should bear in mind, and of course, as is to be expected, is that there's a considerable amount of formality in the application process. Uh, the procedural requirements for implementing such a scheme are set out in part 49 and practice direction 49A of the CPR. And one also uh, must um, pay attention to the requirements of chapter 21 of the Chancery Guide and the practice statement which accompanies it. In terms of issuing the proceedings and themselves, uh, a claim form is going to be issued and amongst uh, other matters, there are going to be three important uh, things to be sought from the court in that respect. The first is uh, directions uh, that the meeting of the members or creditors be convened. Uh, the second is that the court sanction the compromise uh, or arrangement if it is approved at the meeting and a direction for a further hearing for that purpose. And the final point, a direction that the claimant file with the court a copy of the report by the chairman of each court convened meeting. The claim form itself should come with a supporting witness statement and that should set out all of the relevant facts, including the rationale for the scheme, the proposed location of the meeting, the various classes of shareholders and creditors to be involved and details of any required advertisements. Uh, and a copy of the scheme circular therefore should be sent to the members or to the creditors um, and that should be attached to the witness statement. Once the court has called the meeting, um, the next stage is notification. And at the stage of notification, the company sends a notice to the members and or to the creditors, uh, summoning the meeting together with an explanatory statement on the effect of the proposed scheme. Now, this explanatory statement is an important document. It's required by section 897 of the Companies Act and its importance comes because at the subsequent hearing stage, the court is going to go on to consider whether the explanatory statement was fair and whether it provided all information reasonably necessary to enable a reader to decide how to vote insofar as that is possible. Now, another thing which this statement must do and this is as a result of section 897.2 of the Act, is it must disclose any material interests of the directors in whatever capacity uh, and the effect of the scheme on those interests. Uh, and if any change is not disclosed, then the company will have to satisfy the court that no reasonable member or creditor uh, who'd been aware of the information concerned would have, just, would have changed their decision on how to vote. And that's simply one example of, of the strictness in some respects of the formality requirements. The meeting is the next stage, and really it's the bit in bold here, which is worth uh, focusing on. Uh, the scheme needs to be approved by majority in number, representing three quarters in value of the members or creditors of each class, uh, as is relevant, whether they vote uh, by person or in proxy. And that's a point to keep very much in mind when we go um, to look at, at the new um, and, and supplementary uh, regime in the second half of this uh, talk. This, um, I suppose, in some respects, I could call the bear slide. Uh, the hearing, the court will uh, meet uh, and it will consider um, in accordance with the requirements of the Act and uh, the facts at hand, whether um, the scheme should be approved or whether it shouldn't. One thing to note in this respect, um, because I'm just going to deal with the role of the court in a moment in slightly more detail, but, but at this stage, uh, any proposed scheme should not include any modification provisions uh, and it shouldn't be altered 
after it has been voted on and sanctioned. And that's the case even if all of the creditors um, or the members acquiesce in those alterations. That's the effect of a 1938 decision, uh, DV uh, and People's Bank of Northern India uh, Limited. The final step, uh, before just turning to look at the role of the court in, in somewhat more detail, is effectiveness. Will, um, if the court's approved it, uh, the arrangement become effective? Uh, and it's set out on screen there how that is done, and it's done by the relevant delivery. So in terms of the role of the court, the court is involved really at, at two different stages in the process. The, the first stage is the court has got to decide whether to order meetings of members and or creditors to be convened for the purposes of voting on the scheme. And the second is the court is going to have to decide quite simply whether to sanction the scheme, uh, even if it's been approved by the members or creditors. And that second point raises for us uh, the point that this isn't a rubber stamping exercise from the court. It is an exercise of judicial discretion. So at the first stage, uh, the court um, has to decide um, whether the scheme has sufficient general support to uh, have a prospect of uh, success and um, whether the relevant divisions have been done uh, properly. Ultimately, when the court comes uh, to the decision with respect to whether to sanction uh, the scheme, it must decide whether necessarily it's been approved. That includes a consideration as to whether each class of members has been fairly represented as to whether there has been compliance with the Companies Act and also with the general uh, law. Uh, and that uh, can relate to things such as, as how acquiescence um, was obtained and also whether ultimately everything is uh, reasonable. Uh, and this is brought out um, in a case called Re-Anglo Continental Supply Company Limited uh, from 1922. So fairly uh, well-established uh, principles in, in play here. There's a list of commonly used documents on screen just now. I won't linger on it, but it may uh, prove um, useful uh, for consideration uh, later. Skipping on then uh, into the, the second half of the discussion, uh, the restructuring plans uh, re regime uh, was brought in by the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 and the provision is given effect in part 26A of the um, Companies Act. It's colloquially known uh, as the super scheme, and it's designed as a powerful and flexible um, process whereby a court can supervise and authorize a restructuring. Uh, there is, uh, you'll see the, the sort of third category down there, one of the clunkiest and, and perhaps ugliest phrases in the uh, common law, cross um, class cram down. And uh, we will come to that in some detail. There was the pioneering example of restructuring uh, plans, re-Virgin Atlantic uh, Airways. I don't propose to go to it in any detail, though I do mention two points on it uh, later. Uh, and I leave it there uh, as some um, point of interest should people uh, wish to pursue it. And also uh, a reference um, to the relevant practice statement at the bottom uh, of the page. So this new regime draws some inspirations from schemes of arrangement and the restructuring plan, however, does have critical differences. Uh, and the critical difference, probably the most critical difference to a scheme of arrangement is that a restructuring plan can be imposed on non-consenting or dissenting, had to put it that way, classes of creditors. And that's where a cross-class uh, cram down uh, comes in. And we look at that in a little bit of detail below. In terms of the proposal, um, it's most likely to be proposed by uh, the debtor or, or the company. Creditors and shareholders are competent to do so, but they would face significant um, resourcing uh, requirements in terms of putting together a realistic and, and credible uh, programme. So it's anticipated that the debtors or the company generally will 
delete this. There is a very important uh, qualifying condition to mention at this stage, and that is in order to be able to use the restructuring plan, uh, it, the company in question must be a company which has encountered or is likely to encounter financial difficulties that are affecting or will or may affect its ability to carry on business as a going concern. So in that respect, there is a difference with schemes of arrangement in that there is an upfront eligibility requirement that the business is or is likely to face financial volatility and stress. Now, I've set out the um, process on the screen uh, there. You can see four steps uh, to be uh, gone through. I, I've cut the cake that way uh, as opposed to the five steps uh, under the um, scheme of arrangements uh, system. What must um, a restructuring plan contain? Well, it must involve some form of compromise or arrangement. Those terms will be familiar to you, uh, with the purpose being to deal with the company's uh, aforementioned financial difficulties. So similarities with schemes of arrangement are evident, but as are the differences. Valuation um, details uh, there appear on screen. It enables um, the compromise of the debt and equity claims of creditors and or shareholders um, with which the court is satisfied have no genuine economic interest in the company. Uh, as of now, there isn't a decision on what genuine means in this uh, context. And that brings us uh, again to um, cross uh, class cram down. Uh, and this is because the new procedure uh, essentially means that um, there is the potential to limit the ability of, of holding out creditors, creditors who are holding out, uh, who otherwise, under a scheme of arrangement, might be able to block a viable restructuring proposal, which has the overwhelming support of those creditors who retain an economic interest in the business. It also, uh, and this follows necessarily, opens up the possibility of altering equity interests as part of a restructuring plan without the consent um, of particular uh, shareholders. Now this creates uh, what we might refer to uh, as dissenting classes, but these dissenting classes are only able um, to be crammed, at, crammed down, rather, uh, if they would be no worse off in that situation than they would under the relevant alternative. Now, the relevant alternative is whatever the court considers would be most likely to occur in relation to the restructuring plan, were the restructuring plan itself not sanctioned. So it can be seen there that this is going to give the court a wide discretion as to the benchmark as to which it's going to set against the no worst off assessment. In terms of the court's role more broadly, uh, you can see, and we'll see over the next pair of slides, that the court has its role twice again. At the first hearing, uh, the court deals with the following matters. First of all, class composition. Voting on the restructuring plan is by reference to the classes, and the court will examine uh, the proposed class composition at the first hearing. Now, in the Virgin Atlantic case, which I said I would make two references to, uh, the court accepted that the body of law and practice uh, around class composition in the context of schemes of arrangement was, in fact, directly applicable uh, to restructuring plans. Another matter to be considered uh, is jurisdictional uh, issues and it's important to note the contrast with voting thresholds, which we raised in terms of schemes of arrangement. The relevant threshold for approval is 75% in value, that being the gross value 
of debt of creditors in each class who vote. Uh, the requirement from schemes of arrangement um, that a majority number vote uh, does not apply. And that follows from um, the relevant words of the statute. The court's rule comes in again at the second stage, and that is to decide uh, whether, if the relevant requirements at this stage have been met, whether it's going to be just and equitable in order, oh, sorry, whether it's going to be just and equitable if the court does so order that um, the plan can be sanctioned. This same consideration applies at the stage, at this stage in the schemes of arrangement process, and that uh, applies here equally, again, as a virtue of the Virgin Atlantic decision. Now, on screen, I've just tried to bring up um, a summary of some of, of the key points of, of what can be done with respect um, to schemes of arrangement and with respect uh, to the restructuring plan, identifying some of the similarities and some of the differences uh, which um, we have looked at uh, today. Thank you very much to Sam, Hannah and Daniel, in particular Hannah and Daniel who are doing this after a long day in court. Um, a huge thank you to everybody who's attended today, particularly those of you still on the line after um, two and a half hours. Um, thank you to all the speakers, to the host of the breakout rooms, and in particular to the support that we've had from Leanne and Kat um, from Three Hair Court. Please um, do contact us if you want the slides from today. Um, similarly, if you um, would like any in-house training or any other introductions to members of Three Hair Court, please do reach out to us. We're going to go into another breakout room now for anybody who wants to stay and chat. There's just going to be two larger breakout rooms um, at the end. Um, and other than that, thank you again and have a good evening.